Excellent. Welcome to the Metasploit demo meeting. Only a few weeks left until Hacker Summer Camp starts in Vegas. Exciting time. So let's hop in. Modules. We've got some new modules. Everybody likes new modules. Who doesn't like new modules? Uh, our own Sinner, also known as Wei Chen, added a new module for Apache Tomcat, targeting a vulnerability in Windows Tomcat versions 7.0 through 9.x. It takes advantage of the way Java Runtime Engine passes command line arguments. This module will use uses Tomcat's CGI servlet, enable command line arguments logic to gain unauthenticated remote code execution on the target. While the enable command line arguments isn't uh, enabled by default at installation time, this module does contain a check method to let you know if a target appears vulnerable. And uh, we'll have a demo of this today. From contributor Tim Wright comes a module targeting a command injection vulnerability in the Mac OS Time Machine application, versions 10.14.3 and earlier. Using a specially crafted disk label, the TM diagnose binary will allow for command execution. And this module takes advantage of that to gain privilege escalation via an existing session. And I believe we'll have a demo of this as well. Contributor B. Coles added a new module targeting the ServeView FTP server application, versions prior to 15.1.7. Relying on a combination of setUID and a call to system that lacks validation, this module uses the prepare installation flag to gain command execution and escalate the privilege of an existing session on a Linux target. Pretty cool. And contributor Rudup and our own WVU worked on a module to exploit a remote file inclusion vulnerability found in some super smart, to say that it's not super, supra, supra smart cloud TV devices, allowing a local attacker to broadcast any video they like to the target device with no authentication required. You know, yeah, 10 hours of epic sax guy, anyone? You could do it. And let's see some interesting other work going on. Uh, our own WV updated the MSF console search command to return the results of any previous search by default, returning nothing if there was no previous search. This can be useful if your search has scrolled off the page and you'd like to see those last search results again, which you can now do by just typing search with nothing else. Easy peasy. Also from WV, a new gather proof option was added to the SSH login modules so that these modules will work with certain targets like brocade switches. Please note that the default behavior of these SSH login modules has also been updated to not gather proof of access unless gather proof is set to true. Our own ACAMIC updated the pass-through functionality in MSF console for unknown commands, which improves the usability of many commands like man, uh, for instance, or Python via better input output behavior. That's very nice. And our own Buster B deprecated the DB rebuild cache command since we're no longer using database backed module cache and framework, providing a nice message instead of an error. So nice set of improvements there. And bug fixes, we have three pages worth of bug fixes to talk about. Uh, we've got a lot, that's great. Contributor Tim Wright fixed the shell command on Android Interpreter to explicitly use the correct path to the shell binary. Our own mkino fixed an SNMP no such instance bug in the SNMP enum module, super cool. And Matthew also fixed a missing workspace bug within the open VAS importer. Our own Shelby Pace fixed a crash in the creds command when a credential doesn't have a private object associated with it. Dig that. And our own Jay Barnett deregistered the password spray option from login scanner modules since it's not supported there yet. And uh, this portion of the list are all fixes from our own WVU including a fix to the SSH exec module related to it hanging on exec and blocking on close sometimes. So it shouldn't, shouldn't do that. Also a fix for a crash in modules that call the get URI method from the HTTP server library before the services started. And an update to the behavior of the send request CGI and send request raw methods in the HTTP client library to return immediately when called to the zero second timeout. And WV also fixed some improper invocations of the command PSH payload method where the supplied architecture was supplied as an array and not a string. So super cool. Good fixes there. And a last set of bug, bug fixes from our own Buster B comes a fix to enable UDP support only where there are compatible payloads, removing some broken stage or stage combinations from the payload module list. And Buster B also fixed an issue where reverse HTTPS handlers report that they did not properly bind to a free port 
pinning us to the previous version of the rec socket gym while we sort that out. And rounding out our list of fixes this time around, contributor CCA fixed an uninitialized SOC adder LEN value in the 64-bit Linux shell find port payload. Super cool. Uh, and a bonus slide. Uh, so if you're headed out to Vegas for DEF CON next month, a bunch of the Metasploit crew from Rapid7 will be there too. And for our open source security meetup, also known as OSSM, or pronounced awesome, this year we'll be hosting what we're calling open source office hours on Friday and Sunday at a suite in Valleys. Do you have questions around some Metasploit development or integration you're working on or thinking about doing? You want to chat with others about your open source project? Then come on by. You can get all the details via our recent blog post at blog.rapid7.com. And, and blog.rapid7.com is also where you can catch up on recent framework activity via our Metasploit, uh, weekly Metasploit wrap-up blog post there. And as always, a huge thanks to everybody who contributes and helps make Metasploit better. Thank you. There's a thank you. Awesome. All right, so uh, we're showing this time, time machine demo. Um, this is a local privilege escalation, so it's going to require a shell on an existing exploitable virtual machine. Um, I happen to have one of these handy over here as a, as a vagrant image I built, so we should be good to go. Um, first thing we're going to do to demonstrate this exploit is we're just going to go ahead and set up a handler and, and run a pre-existing shell. We'll go, and go ahead and get that started now. Um, just to verify, we have a copy of uh, Mac OS 10.13.3, which is one of the uh, previous vulnerable versions. Uh, let's go ahead and background that shell. We're going to use the uh, fantastic new search command uh, to find the model that we're looking for. Search for time machine. You can see it's right here. Uh, we'll type use zero, which allows us to automatically use the search results. Another nice uh, feature that's recently been added to Nestploit. Um, to give you kind of an, uh, an idea of what goes on with this vulnerability, you can type info-d and it'll pop open the knowledge base that talks a bit about why the exploit works, how it works. Basically, it involves um, a command injection in the TM diagnose binary that um, based on a malformed uh, disk label, you can inject shell commands. Um, pretty cool vulnerability, and I, I hear there are actually a few more variants that, that need to be fixed as well, so look out for maybe some updates to this module um, uh, later on. But I'll show you how the module works. Um, given that it is a local uh, privilege escalation, uh, one of course needs to run it through an existing session, so we'll go ahead and set that up right now. We'll also set uh, an lhost for us to connect back on with the, the privilege shell. And we're good to go. Let's go ahead and run the module. Now I will uh, warn you guys, uh, just, just as kind of a, a pre-set expectation, because this relies on some, uh, some periodic processing that happens within Time Machine, it takes a little while for the exploit to actually run. Um, probably about two or three minutes. Um, if someone else would like to show a demo um, in, in the meantime, I'm certainly happy to sort of yield the floor and then we can come back and I'll show you when it's got in the shell. So I'm going to show the Apache Tomcat uh, remote code execution. Uh, this module takes advantage of the way the Java runtime engine passes command line arguments in Windows. Uh, this is the, the original PR for it. Uh, you, it's got a lot of good information about what, what's all required to be set up in, in order for this to work. Um, but it's got a lot, plenty of good detail uh, about it. Uh, I'm going to make a shameless plug for uh, our Metasploitable 3 offering. Uh, that's what I used in this case. So it was, I was able to just use a, you know, pull a Vagrant file, do a Vagrant up, have a Windows uh, 2008 server going and, and no time flat that already had a vulnerable version of Tomcat installed. Uh, and then it was just a matter of uh, following some of the instructions here required to have the um, enable command line arcs uh, set up and, uh, and such. It was pretty, pretty, pretty simple. So I'll show the module uh, executing. Uh, let's see. Here is. Let's so go back to this is the this is the VM here. You can see that there is a instance of Tomcat running uh, right there. 
and we'll start up. I should have should have had that running earlier. So, but it won't take it won't take a couple of minutes. It'll it'll be time machine maybe. <laughs> Fingers crossed. So this so this script does it, the 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 vulnerable target. The setting, uh, as I mentioned when we were talking through the slides a moment ago, uh, is not a default setting um, at installation time. Uh, but for for folks that have it enabled uh, on on vulnerable versions of Tomcat, I've actually seen some places say that like all versions up to nine .x are vulnerable. But I believe that we're we're saying this. We've only at least our, to our knowledge seven .dot zero up are are vulnerable. Um, in any case, it's you just pretty simple. You just select the, the Tomcat CGI command line args module. And uh, let's, let's just check what our, our uh, IP address for our Windows instance is. Looks like it's 172.28.128. So it, goes, it, it hasn't changed. And we're running Tomcat on port 8282 in this case. That's what uh, Metasploit reset it up as. And per the description in the PR, you have to you have to have a, a target URI into the uh, CGI directory uh, for any any script that lives in there. And at this point, now we're ready to see if our our uh, target is vulnerable. We'll do a check. Hey, the target is vulnerable. All right, so let's put our money where our mouth is and see see what happens when we execute this exploit. It's pretty quick to execute. Uh, at least these are being running locally, so there's you know no no network. Kind of situation, and at this point, uh, we have an interpreter session, and we should be able to say um, sysinfo and see that it is Windows 2008, and we should be able to do a get UID, and we can see that we are system. Easy peasy. Uh, any questions? Going once. All right, so. The server UFTP server, uh, love you, I'm sure, are, are familiar with it, but it's a fairly common, fairly well-known FTP server. Uh, it's really fe pretty fully featured, actually. So I've got one here set up locally. Uh, just got users and groups and directories all set up, and I've logged myself out. Um, but uh, what this this uh, this vulnerability is, is it involves having uh, initial access to a machine. So here, I've got an um, interpreter session, which notice I'm just UID 1000. I'm a, a normal user on a, this uh, you know, stock Ubuntu box. Uh, and so what this vulnerability is taking advantage of is a flag left inside that serve you uh, binary. So in fact, if you take a look here real quick, uh, I can look in my user, sure, uh, let's see here. Actually, I probably have it. No, I lost it well. Uh, if we do user local serve you, uh, you'll notice I have the serve UFTP server here, and this is actually the, the binary itself. And there's a couple of undocumented uh, command line arguments associated with this. And, and uh, what Pierce was mentioning uh, earlier this morning was the uh, prepare installation flag. And so that's what this module is taking advantage of. So you see here we've got Linux local serve UFTP server prepare installation prevesc. Uh, if I take a quick look at this guy, uh, the uh, path is already set, which lucky for me works out nicely. That's our default, or at least according to the documentation. Uh, I do need to set the session that we already have set up, and then I've already gone ahead and configured a payload here. And uh, it's as simple as that. So from this, it does a quick check, make sure that file exists, it's executable, it has uh, set UID privileges, uh, which by default it should. And then we go ahead and kick off this command, notice uh, our prepare installation command line argument here. Uh, we do end up writing a payload to disk, and unfortunately, uh, the, the module is not able to delete that, but uh, we do have root privileges now, so we'd have to go ahead and, and, uh, and you know, keep, it, keep an eye on that or set up a, a cron job or something to clean that up, unfortunately. Um, yeah, that's just kind of the nature of it. So uh, pretty straightforward module. Um, yeah, that's it. Any questions? Nice. Hey, nice, Aaron. Thanks. Sure thing. Excellent.